right in his ears. All right, welcome to No Way But North, where we talk about the miracles of recovery and the tools used to achieve them. My name is Cooper. I, my, Cooper Lyons. My clean date is November 27th, 2010. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Big John Meldrum. How you doing, sir? I'm full. Yeah, we just ate lunch. I know. Are you a little uncomfortable? I am. Which is hard for me to believe that you actually get comfortable. You ate more than me, but my, my belt feels like it's cutting into my stomach. Well, just breathe a little bit, bro. Just... I just can't wait to take my pants off. <laughs> I'm 6'5", 350, wearing skinny With jeans. With that being said, <laughs> I'm going to introduce our guest. Um, Erica Scarberry holds a bachelor's in social work from the University of Cincinnati, as well as a master's in social work from Home of the Trojans, University of Southern California. Uh, Erica served as an intern for Military Veteran Services in San Diego, correct? Yeah. Um, before becoming a counselor at Summit County Jail in Ohio, and now Erica is a primary counselor at Ashwood, um, helping save lives and restore relationships over there. So thanks for joining us. We appreciate you being here on a Sunday. We know we know that uh, we don't all get days off every week. Yeah. So appreciate thanks you taking for having the time me. to be Southern here. Southern California. Like, yeah. why Idaho? It's a good question. <laughs> I was like, sunny California. Like, sunny California. You. Gosh. I don't know why I end up anywhere that I end up, really. <laughs> Well, and you went back to Ohio from there. That's yeah. even colder, isn't it? Or a little more here, snow? It's, yeah, it's pretty similar climate, but they, like, got a foot of snow last night. Ugh. Mm-hmm. I kind of missed the snow. I was going to say, if you grew up in snow, you mm-hmm. probably missed it in California. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thanks for being here. Guys, you know we always start with the quote. Um, today's quote is, I don't focus on what I'm up against. I focus on my goals and I try to ignore the rest. Venus Williams. Um, we're talking about ADHD and uh, the link between diagnosis of ADHD and addiction today. So I was trying to find like a quote about focus. I'm not quite sure how that will relate to ADHD, the goals part. Um, but when... I know when I have a lot of noise going on around me, it's really hard for me to focus on what I'm doing in that moment. Um, so whether that's like actual physical noise, like sometimes the music at Ashwood just shoots straight into my office and I can't get anything done mm-hmm. until I go turn the volume down. But even beyond that, when I have a lot of stuff going on in my life, it's really hard for me to focus on the things that I need to get done, whether that's at work, whether that's goals I'm working on at home. Um, so that's kind of what I thought of when I heard that awesome Venus Williams quote. What came to your mind? Uh, do you want to read it to me again? I can do that. Yes. <laughs> John yes. always asked, so now I'm going to have to read it three times, even though he has it on that piece of paper. Um, I don't focus on what I'm up against. I focus on my goals, and I try to ignore the rest. Huh. So I was saying I suck at that ignoring the rest part. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm hearing in that is, like, not focusing on the bullshit and kind of staying focused yeah. on, like, the like having a goal oriented mind and not focusing mm-hmm. on like what's going to happen in between there cuz we could get easily distracted in the long term of like goals mhm yeah well and do do what you need to do to be able to reach those goals mm-hmm. right and ignore all the other stuff yeah, that don't pops let that up drag along you the down way or, yeah right. totally cool john really you're going to make <laughs> me read it a third time oh my god <laughs> i don't focus on what i'm up against i focus on my goals and i try to ignore the rest Venus Williams. I mean, a lot just going, will you read it one more time? No, (laughs) I won't. So a lot of just kind of going off of like what Erica said, this idea of, you know, trying to figure out how to set um, healthy goals and being able to accomplish them and the things and the dedication that needs to go into accomplishing those two, kind of being able to block out the white noise and everything around us and and find out what's relevant within our lives and what's not. that was a beautifully articulated thought. Thank you. I have my moments. Yeah, I'm actually kind of impressed. That was, that was really good. Um, so let's just jump into it. I know that probably most everybody that's listening knows, at least has an idea of what ADHD is, right? It's that kind of hyperactive kid. At least that's the image in everybody's head is a hyperactive kid that is looking at the butterflies on the wall and can't focus on anything that's going on in front of them in, in a classroom is usually kind of what comes, I think, at least what comes to my mind when I think of somebody with ADHD is mm-hmm. like a classroom setting. Um, Because that's, I think, where the symptoms probably show through the most. Um, So just kind of talk to us more about what ADHD is, is not. uh, Maybe some stereotypes that aren't true, things like that. Yeah. I want to start with, like, disclosing that I am not, like, a professional in this sense. This is not, like, my field. But I have, like, a personal Mm -hmm. interest in, like, learning about ADHD and the link between that and substance abuse. Um, 
So, I mean, I think that there's several ways to like identify um, ADHD, but the symptoms are so closely linked to other diagnosable. We were talking about that. Yeah, yeah. and so like, it can be behavioral symptoms that an individual is having, so like being fidgety, Mm -hmm. like unable to sit still, those sort of things. And then there's like cognitive symptoms to that, like the inability to focus, forgetfulness, those sort of things. And Mm -hmm. then um, in regards to mood, even so like Mm -hmm. irritability easy to get angry those sort of symptoms so there's a lot that goes into like the symptoms of adhd but it like i said it crosses over into other diagnoses like oppositional defiant disorder or um even symptoms of ocd cross over with Mm -hmm. symptoms of adhd so it's it's difficult to kind of navigate and like find yeah. the proper diagnosis because they're so intertwined. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so when we were talking about that, the first time we were talking about the topic, so do those, do the treatments for those other similar um, diagnoses kind of, do they line up? Mm-hmm. So there's different kinds of treatment mm-hmm. for ADHD, one of which is like using stimulants, right? Yeah, so which we is think like of, the most common. Well, yeah, right? we think of those. So anybody who's diagnosed with ADHD, 70 to 80 percent are going to end up taking stimulants to address the symptoms. Stimulants, like which kind of stimulants? That would be like Adderall, mm-hmm. Vyvanse, um, those sort of medications, Ritalin. Yeah, amphetamines, yeah. essentially. There's also some non-stimulant medications. Those are not as popular in the prescribing world. Um, I, so I was diagnosed with ADD, and I took one. I don't want to say, I don't know if we're allowed to say the medication name, but I remember, like, if I didn't eat, I would puke hmm. every single time. Uh, within when two you took hours the medication of taking it, if morning, I did not yeah. have breakfast like b- right before I took it, then I would puke. Um, and by like 11 AM, I could, <clears throat> excuse me, I could not stay awake. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. no matter what I was doing, I was like, it was a non-stimulant or a stimulant. It was non-stimulant mm-hmm. cause my parents did a bunch of research and blah, blah, blah. They yeah. said like, cause I know there's a lot of side effects with stimulant medication. And I, I was the same way. I took Adderall. So I was subscribed to Adderall when I was like 13 or 14. And I remember, Distinctly, like I had a mentor and I was working with him, and I took the medication, and then by like one o'clock, like I was just like nodding out, and that was like that was a big thing. Is like I remember them telling my parents, like you could see this distinct difference when yeah he was on it compared that's to when what it my was parents were trying to avoid was like they heard a bunch of horror stories. Mm-hmm. So sorry, side note there, yeah. But. Um, So, yeah, treatment for those other diagnoses, do they line up? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously there's other sort of, I was going to say there's a third treatment that people say they use for ADHD, which is behavioral therapy. Oh, okay. Or, like, where we have parent-child therapy. So, like, we're addressing the whole family system, having the, the parent interact with the child and, like, learning and, like, how to cope with and address these behaviors. But I that would, takes time and yeah, work. Yeah, right. So they say <laughs> that that's like what's happening and is a form or like a treatment modality, mm-hmm. but I don't know how frequently that's actually happening. Um, and so for some of those other things like OCD, like the behavioral therapy is good for that. Yeah. There are medications that can go or can assist with yeah. treating OCD mm-hmm. as well. But, but are, they're not stimulants, are they? No. Okay. That's what I thought. No. Um, so it all just depends. Okay. So, and well, and the rate of misdiagnosis, I know that's kind of the next thing actually on the list. So that Mm -hmm. might be a good transition was talking about rates of diagnosis over the last 10 years have, have increased like a, a insane amount. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's, we could talk about all the possibilities for that reason, right? We could talk about the, the amount of time that kids that are getting diagnosed sit and watch TV and they're looking at screens that change scenes every three seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, we can talk about, you know, always having a smartphone. We can talk about um, just all kind. I mean, who knows, chemicals in the water. But um, what it comes down to, I think what we were talking about is that there's a lot of just straight misdiagnosis, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, because we were talking about how the symptoms present for several diagnoses. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, which one is accurate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or even it's a kid that just kind of wants to have some attention from Mm -hmm. their parents. And all their parents do is feed them sugar and tell them to go play their video games. And the kid isn't getting exercise. He's not getting healthy nutrition. He's not getting, like, developmental needs met. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Which is becoming more and more frequent. Especially in today's society, mm-hmm. right? 
Because yeah. isn't that a pretty common diagnosis that mo most of the time we diagnose the hyper kid that he's ADD or ADHD? Like that's such a common diagnosis that we see when people come in that they're mm -hmm. diagnosed with. It's one of the most overdiagnosed things in today's society. Yeah. My like personal thought on that, or if I had yeah. to like think about why that happened, I think about like the opiate crisis. Mm. And like we thought that these medications were like this life saving drug that was just gonna cure pain and like everyone would be groovy. And like I think that the same thing essentially happened with like diagnosis of ADHD and the medications that went with ADHD. So that's just like my. Well, look how, how abused everything, like Adderall's. Mm -hmm. I cannot so tell you how, like, it's not even considered like. A drug in high school it's like or college like I have to I have a test I got to study for so can I I'm just gonna borrow Joey's Adderall mm -hmm. yeah like it's not it's like having a cup of coffee it's kind of insane yeah well and when I came into this field this idea like I remember the first patient that I ever worked with it came in for Adderall's it's like like we're you're here for Adderall? Yeah, but medical professionals and pharmaceutical companies will argue that the doses that we prescribe those stimulants are not habit forming. Right. Which I think is trash because it absolutely is habit forming. Yeah. Especially, I mean, just behavior based. Like, if every single time I need to focus, like, if I'm a kid in college and every time I need to study or cram and I take Adderall and then I get into the workplace and I'm like, I have deadlines and things like that, like, I've developed a behavior. And, and I and can't need focus unless I take this take drug. This, mm -hmm. Right. So it may have like, you know, nobody, I guarantee at one point in time, nobody thought like hydrocodone or things like this, these pain medications were going to become addictive, mm -hmm. right? Until 15, 20 years later, we're dealing with this opioid crisis. So, yeah, well, and I, kind of, I so I want to come back to like the misdiagnosis and the effects of that, but I wanted to, so do you, I know you have the paper that you wrote on yeah. this. Um, I, and I can't remember exactly, but didn't the rates of diagnosis similarly increase with the rates of substance abuse over a certain period of time? Yes. So the correlation, or it was talking about um, at one point, so about 30 years ago, it was 12 per 1,000 individuals being diagnosed. Okay. Um, and so by the late 90s, that went from 12 to 35 out of 1,000 oh. individuals were being diagnosed. So more than 100% increase. Yeah, and so, um, and then there's a correlation with the increase in substance mm -hmm. abuse as well with, you know, in okay. the last 20 years. Yeah. And some may argue that the two aren't related. Like I said, <laughs> like medical providers and like pharmaceutical companies will argue that like these stimulants are mm -hmm. not addictive and don't. Yeah. have these negative ramifications but i just have a hard time believing that yeah yeah when well, we see it just yeah day. for how frequently we see individuals coming into our facility that are struggling with adhd or you know have been diagnosed with adhd at some point and are now suffering from a substance abuse yeah. issue or so. depression or anxiety or mm -hmm. something else like in childhood right so, I, I mean i would say what it comes down to maybe not even necessarily like all the kids that have add turn out to be addicts but it was I, I would say it's even more probably focused around a culture of of quick fixes, mm. right? Like instead of like every time I've talked to um, like a provider, like a psychiatrist, um, which is what I really like about North Point Ashwood is our psychiatrist really takes some time to actually know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't spend more than 15 minutes in a psychiatrist's office. They asked me what's going on, I'm sad, or I can't focus. Okay, mm -hmm. here's your prescription. They didn't mm -hmm. ask me if I was exercising. They didn't ask me if I was dieting. They didn't ask me if I was going out and having social time. They didn't ask me if I was um, organized. They didn't ask me if I was like trying meditation or breathing exercises. Like it's just this quick fix culture that I think is is just countrywide with yeah. everything. Well, and just kind of going back to that idea, what Erica talked about when she first came in is this idea of like behavioral therapy mm. it takes time and effort, right? And like it's everybody has difficult. to be on board for it. So it's not just this aspect of um, little Timmy and mom, you know, work on this for a couple of days. It's like mom, dad, siblings, all these people have to be on board. Mm -hmm. And that's time, that's effort, that's a, you know. For like more than a year yeah. to like build a base 
to life. schedule, to build schedules and routines and new behaviors and things mm -hmm. like that. When I could give a pill and this, this child who's bouncing off the walls will, you know, calm adjust down. and calm Shut down. Fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> Sit down and yeah. be quiet. So, yeah. um, but that's a hard thing is like, and as today's society, if you look at it, like, that idea of actually, especially within addiction, of taking like time and energy to put into your recovery, like people are always trying to find the the easiest road, that shortcut. Yeah. So, yeah, well, and then the people that don't really have ADD get given Adderall, which is just, I mean, I don't want to, I won't say it's an amphetamine. Yeah, it's an. I was going to say like a watered down of meth, but. It's, it's an amphetamine, it's a stimulant, and it really changes their brain, and it's right. really developing, like their brain is physically being developed still. Mm -hmm. um, so can, what? So we kind of talked on the medications that are being prescribed, um, but what are the, like what are the effects on the brain? What kind of stuff happens to somebody that um, really would possibly need that medication yeah. um, versus somebody that doesn't? Well, not super skilled in this area, but I know that just like the medications, it, dopamine receptors, mm -hmm. we're having that in early childhood. Um, I also like was interested in like the negative ramifications of taking these medications, such as like we have like a suppressed appetite when we're taking stimulants, mm -hmm. right? So then kids are not eating. And so there's like, what's the correlation between taking these medications and like, developmental like mm -hmm. progress because if we're not eating yeah. as much as we should be like we don't have that natural hunger there there has been some research to show that stimulants do impact like one's physical growth i was yeah well whenever i i wouldn't eat from like 9 a.m to 4 and then i would just be ravenous and i would just binge eat a ton of food mm -hmm. too so i wonder if there's a link between like obesity or anything like that also I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm just curious. That'd be something to I feel Alex, like I've typically seen the opposite. It. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen like the opposite in individuals really? who okay. take amphetamines. Like There's I had this friend in high all. school and she would pick me up and take me to school and she was diagnosed ADHD, took Adderall. Mm -hmm. um, and I could tell within the, the minute I stepped in her car if she took her medication or not. If she did... Really? she would be chill, wouldn't have breakfast, like would not be eating. If I got in the car and she had a toaster strudel and she was talking, I'm like, Amanda, we gotta go down the street. You know, you forgot to take your medications this morning. Oh. And she was like a size zero the entire time we were in high school. Like I'm telling you, this was like the skinniest, like the, the skinniest people I've seen. That's crazy. Stopped taking Adderall after high school. She gained probably like 50 pounds. In a good way, I'm hoping. Well, yes. <laughs> I'm assuming. <laughs> she, could, she could use she, some she has, she Yeah, she had the ability to put that on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and that was another thing that I know. Like, most medications need time to build up in your system, mm -hmm. right? Like any depression medication, most mm -hmm. anxiety medication, I would say, if you're taking it the right way, mm -hmm. like you have to take it for at least two weeks, Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. You guys know a little bit more three, about that. Three to me. six, typically. To build up in your system and feel like the effects, mm -hmm. versus like yeah, with Adderall, if it's I didn't take it that day, acting. I was all over the mm -hmm. place. I, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Well, that's um, you know a thing to remember, especially with some of this stuff, especially within today's society, is like this idea of how well are people actually taking it, mm -hmm. because like medications will be prescribed, whether it's you know. Um, Zoloft or Prozac or, you know, Adderall or, you know, whatever it may be with this idea of a lot of people take it and think that like, I'm, I'm going to be on this forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like that, you know, and that's a huge thing is, you know, Erica, like we get patient sometimes and it's like, yeah, I've been on Prozac for 25 years. And my opinion that medications are not meant to be that way. It's just mm -hmm. like, something to help us get through to the point where we are able to regulate ourselves mm -hmm. and then we stop. But like people will continue to take them, especially like I see with like Adderall is like, it's not taken as prescribed. It's like, I'm going to, I have a study. I have to study or I have a test or I have, you know, like I'm next couple of days at work are going to be crazy. So like, I'm going to have to take these and then like they stockpile. Yeah. Or then they start taking like, Oh, today's going to be pretty crazy. So instead of taking the one, I'm going to take two or three instead. Mm. Yeah. Well, and then that starts the cycle of addiction. Yeah. yeah. And most people I know who end up taking medication or Adderall in that sense of like, I need to study are typically the individuals who don't have ADHD. Right. 
So, like, everybody I knew who had ADHD hated taking their medications, and they were the ones who sold their script in high school or gave it away because it's like, I do not like the way that this physically makes me feel. Mm -hmm. So then the individuals who don't have ADHD are now taking it, and they like it because it's, it's like, doing meth. It's the opposite feeling, yeah. Yeah. It's just like, you know, like that argument with coffee, (laughs) like... Give a coffee to somebody that has truly ADHD. It's gonna make you them chill them out. To make them chill, you know, somebody that doesn't, it's gonna wake them up and like perk them up and do all this stuff. Same thing with that kind of medication. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was gonna say, like, I can probably count the number of people that I've met on one hand that actually have like true need medication ADHD, and I can't even tell you how many people I've met that were diagnosed and were taking stimulants on a daily basis mm-hmm. that did like that did not need to have them. Well, and you can you can always see at least for me personally, like especially working in the realm of addiction, you can always tell who is truly, you know, been diagnosed with like ADHD compared to those that were like, oh yeah, like I've been ADHD since I was 14 years old and I took this and, mm-hmm. you know, they don't have a problem. And then you see that one person in group and they're just like fidgeting and bouncing and all over the place. Mm-hmm. You're like, hmm, that's, that's what it looks like. So, mm. yep. Um, okay. So that was a bit of a tangent, uh, but I do. <laughs> so what, what, so for like the people that whether you're diagnosed or not, what are some of the long-term effects? Cause I know we talked about like, mm-hmm. I mean, we touched on like the classroom aspect and then when you get out of college or high school or whatever, and you don't really have that need to like, you know, there's not a lot of places where you're focused on something like you are in school, I think in, in the career world. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people st- kind of stop taking that medication or they don't have mm-hmm. to. Um, so kind of what are the long-term effects? What starts to happen? Things like that. So this is a difficult topic because there's not a whole lot of research. Like I said, medical providers will argue that this medication has no no long-term adverse side effects. And so there's side effects while taking the medication, such as like difficulty sleeping or like suppressed appetite, um, irritability. So like there are things, but it's like, if you stop this medication, you will no longer have those symptoms. Yeah. So like your appetite's not going to be impacted. You're probably not going to have difficulty falling asleep. Like things go back to normal. You won't have cravings. Yeah. So it's it's hard to say what the actual long term ramifications are of the medication because there's not a whole lot of research. Hmm. Medical providers will argue that there's nothing negative that's going to come from taking these things. That blows my mind. Right. But, okay. Um. But so, I mean, but realistically, right, so if I'm, I, I was very lucky, I found recovery in high school, and I was able to take my medications as prescribed, and I, and I used them kind of the way that you were talking about, which is where I used them to get myself on top of my grades, and to get organized, and start building some habits like exercise, and meditation, and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and now I have those habits and things in place, also the Buster Bronco thing just took away all my ADHD energy. Because well, you were doing backflips at Boise State football games. Exactly. And I was just ex- exhausted <laughs> the whole rest of the time. Um, but I was able to kind of get my shit together and from there, you know, wean off my medication and take them the way they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, but for like the kid that's diagnosed at 11 years old and is taking Ritalin for um, his, I mean, all through high school. So that's what almost 10 years close to it. Um, and then all of a sudden he's not like he's going to, there's going to, his brain isn't going to be developed the way somebody who didn't have that experience Mm -hmm. and when we go from like why do we take those medications right to like decrease those symptoms of like inability to focus um like the fidgetiness the anxiety like that's what those medications are for so we stop taking those i'm still going to experience those symptoms that's probably not comfortable when i haven't been experiencing those for 11 years and i have no other coping skills yeah so I stopped taking those medications and it's like, well, now what? I don't like the way I'm feeling because I haven't felt this way. I haven't had to deal with these symptoms because I've been taking a medication. Mm-hmm. And so now it's, I, I turned to, I, my personal thought is like, I turn to other substances now. Well, yeah. Because I don't want to feel anxiety. I don't want to feel like I'm unable to focus. I want to be able to turn my brain off. Mm-hmm. Well, and you feel isolated because I know I was obnoxious as shit. You still was are. not. Dude. Were? Hey, hey, whoa, or, hey. <laughs> this isn't the Comedy Central roast of Cooper Lyons, all right? I mean, Let's I'm just, just saying, were. God dang. <laughs> Fine, we'll move on. Just knocking you back down to reality, <laughs> Cooper. You That's know, all. I, I think a big thing is, like, when we start talking about, like, youth and, like, when they start taking this kind of medication, it's hard because... Um, you know, that's such a, a big time for development for within within 
young kids, teenagers, socially, stuff like that. physically, socially, yeah, all these emotionally. Things. And so sometimes, just like we would talk about substances, it's this idea of like, where's their baseline? Because mm. then they do, like, let's say a kid starts taking it when they're 11 or 12. And then parents stay on top of them until they're like 18 or 19, until they leave the house. Mm-hmm. And then they stop stop taking it or whatever. Like, where's their true baseline? Yeah. Like, they haven't had to figure this out. They've, they've spent years taking this medication. And then you see a kid that gets out on his own or her own, and they're just like all over the place, mm-hmm. right? They start trying to figure out ways to calm themselves down or deal with the social anxieties and the anxiety that they have or depression and stuff like this when they've been medicated with, you know, something for their ADHD. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, like, we're trying to figure out, like, what should, and, like, that's a little huge thing is, like, when they come to Ashwood or North Point, we're trying to figure out, like, where the hell's your baseline? Like, what, who, who are you? Without exactly. medication. Without medication, without, medication without, without substances, without anything, you know, because that, I think that's a huge thing is it gets to the point where youth starts to, especially when they take it and then they stop, they start their own self-medication, mm-hmm. right? They start mm-hmm. self-medicating with different substances to help them. Yeah. I know for me, like this idea of like when I, when I got off Adderall, I loved marijuana. Mm. Like that was like my thing. And I remember... Uh, the reason I hated Adderall is because like I could sit there, take it and focus, but like I could only get one thing done. And like, I was so super hyper focused on this one thing that I would let everything else fall. But then as soon as I stopped taking it, I felt super anxious and I would smoke weed and I'd just be like, yeah, I don't really, whatever, bro, whatever. Jack in the box (laughs) tacos. Mm. Ooh, the worst things ever, but they're so amazing. So good. Yeah, side note but like that but that was the thing is like I would start and then like I remember I ended up crashing because I was struggling with my own mental health and self-medicating and still taking the medication from my psychiatrist so like I had all these things compounded and like I wasn't taking care of myself yeah yeah well and then you t- I mean your self-esteem starts to take a hit right because yeah. you're failing classes mm. you're apparently forever obnoxious and um you know you're you start being socially isolated luckily uh, that did not happen to me because i got got guys like big john here i'm gonna start isolating (laughs) um but i mean so yeah you got the social situations because you're obnoxious and out there and kind of weird and you know fidgety and Mm -hmm. and then you're not um you're not performing in class everybody thinks you're stupid you think you're stupid um you're you're being impulsive and making risky decisions, whether you feel those consequences right away or, or later on, but you really start to just compound in on yourself and then you start self-medicating and doing things to make yourself fit in and feel better about mm-hmm. yourself and things like that. And that's just a natural progression into addiction. Yeah. I like where you're going there because I feel like we have spent some time like focusing on like the individuals who mm-hmm. we do treat with medications. So... I've also been interested in, like, what's it look like for an individual to have ADHD and is not diagnosed yeah. and is not taking medications? So this is kind of, like, where it's, like where my interest sparked is my brother. I grew up with my brother, and he struggled in school, got held back in first grade. I mean, like, there was a lot of external things going on, like parents divorcing. And, mm-hmm. like, so there was a lot that went into this. And um, my brother just really struggled in school and, like, couldn't get it. Um, he started self-medicating at a relatively young age. I want to say he probably started smoking weed at like age 12 and like was doing some of these impulsive smoking cigarettes regularly at like age 12 and um, struggling with some other things and then gets diagnosed with ADHD at like the age of 16. And it's like so... To me, there's a correlation between substance abuse and just like the diagnosis itself, regardless of somebody taking medications. Yeah. And there is some correlation in regards to like, we're feeling like with ADHD, like we're feeling impulsive. So like that impulsivity like sparks us to do some risky things or like um, there's a correlation between ADHD and like cigarette abuse yeah, yeah, because cigarettes boost. have some of those like proponents to like relaxing us and like... And so it's weird to think about, like, it's not just, like, uh, taking Adderall. It's also the diagnosis itself that kind of, like, predicts some substance abuse things as well. So 
It's all very interesting, very complex, though. With not a ton of research, unfortunately, no. which blows my mind because of how much of how high the diagnosis rate is mm -hmm. and how much it's jumped up. You'd think, and I mean, I guess, I guess the same with addiction, but I, I, there's probably more research on addiction. There's mm -hmm. probably a greater, like, cultural well, societal impact. And we have to think, like, how recent we started spending time, like, focusing on addiction. Yeah, within like, the last addiction, 15 years. Yeah. And so, like, we haven't made a significant amount of progress with addiction. And quite honestly, people don't really care. Unless you start to get affected by it, which mm, is hilarious. Personally, yeah. Personally, yeah, which is, I think, pretty much everybody is, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, you, you look at it, you look at 25 years ago, you know, um, an LMSW or a CDC counselor, like, were making barely any money because it was this idea of choice, right? Mm. Like, they, people choose to be addicts. Like, you choose to put the, uh, the substance in your system. And so when research and things started coming out with this idea of, like, the disease model of addiction, like, this idea of, like, once you become addicted, like, the physiological makeup of your body drastically changes. Like, that's when people became more aware and they saw that. Now you still have people, and you st I, I would imagine you still have professionals and things like that that will still argue the choice argument of model. choice versus disease. But, I mean, it's the same thing. Is like there's so much – addiction was such a taboo subject for years, mm. and, like, nobody wanted to address it. Mental health was such a taboo subject for years. Nobody wanted to address it. If it was this idea of being vulnerable – and the same thing with this idea of now we take youth with like behavioral problems is still this idea of it's still very new and taboo and there's not a lot of education on it and there's not a lot of research done Shut on up, it. take this pill and we're not going to talk about it. Well, yeah, and it's just like, you know, I've, I, I've seen both arguments on the sense of like there's some families that are like, no, we're not going to diagnose. You know, like they said that, you know, little Timmy has ADHD, but like... I don't want to dope my kid up. And then you have some parents... Or I don't who, want him to be tied to a diagnosis. Right. Or then, then you'll have some parents who'll just be like, no, like, we got to take this and we got to do this. And so, like, there's this extreme mm -hmm. because there's no, there's no kind of... There's no real research done that shows, like, all these things. Like, there's some here and there's some there, but trying to find the root cause is such a major thing. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is you have a lot of kids run around that aren't properly diagnosed and kind of float through. And I think those kids are the ones we start seeing with addiction problems most mm -hmm. of the time is because they go through years and they're not properly diagnosed. They haven't been taking medication or... Or they have been taking medication. Or they medication, have been, but, mo you right know, way. we see a lot of kids, you know, like, if they're anxious and they're bouncing off the walls and they're always hyper and things like that, like, they're going to try to figure out something that makes them calm down, mm -hmm. right? So, or fit in. Or fit in. And so that's such a big thing is like, and, I, and I'll have the argument is like some medication, like some, there are some type of medical interventions that um, I think are great and fantastic for some people. Yeah. And some people do need medications that assist. I was one of them, like, you know, but also at the same time, it's just, we overdiagnose it so much. Mm. If a kid's hyper, <clears throat> right, because he bounces off the walls, we automatically look at him and be like, oh, he's... Like he is ADD or he's ADHD. Like he must be this. Yeah. So. So we're running out of time, but we actually kind of, in all of our bouncing around to topics, we covered everything we had to talk about. Yeah. So uh, is there anything else that you want to touch on or say before we kind of start to close out? I heard something earlier that you mentioned in regards to like this idea of like, watching TV or not having physical activity. Yep. So I kind of wanted to talk about like the causes of ADHD. Yes, yeah, totally. And so there is no correlation between like simply watching too much television okay. and having the diagnosis of ADHD. So that's a common misconception of like, children are just lazy nowadays, we sit them in front of televisions and that's why they get ADHD and that's not the case. Um, <laughs> the actual causes of ADHD- I'm gonna tell my, I got I got something, to, I gotta call my dad after this. <laughs> 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 the actual causes of ADHD stem from like genetics. So like if a parent has ADHD, the likelihood of their child getting ADHD is like 70%. Oh, wow. So okay. it's pretty significant. It's one of those that is easily passed. Yep. Um, there's also a correlation between like maternal like substance use while mm, in the I womb. So like if a child, if yeah. a mother drinks or smokes cigarettes, that has an impact and there is a correlation between that 
mm, and ADHD, okay. as well as some chemicals. I heard you mention something like yeah, that. Was, yeah, so like pesticides, or there's a weird correlation between mm. shit like that too. Or um, some environmental organic stuff, life. I'm assuming also, right? As early childhood stuff. Yeah, so that, that's another interesting point is like a lot of the times we're just looking at an individual's symptoms and not necessarily looking at the child's environment. So if mm. mom and dad are going through a divorce and there's a lot of change going on at home, a child's probably going to display some of these symptoms that look like but ADHD. Not necessarily but have. not necessarily. Yeah, not have ADHD. Yeah. So like we but then they're fail. put on medication for the rest right, of their Right, right. So we fail to look at the whole picture a lot of the time, like what's going on at home with this child. Hmm. Why is this child acting this way? I mean, we can't get a whole picture of a person in 15-minute doctor session? Yeah, and oh typically that's what doctors do. They look at the patient. These are symptoms A, B, and C leads to this treatment. Exactly. 98% of the time a medication. Rather than, like, having a, a patient-centered, like, what's going on around the patient as well. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. I could go on and on about this forever because it's so interesting and there's not a whole lot of research. And I don't know. We could benefit from like knowing mm -hmm. more about this diagnosis and the correlation. But I was thinking earlier as we started this episode, North Point should start a, a research branch. Woo. Research facility. Listen. <laughs> You're like, don't look at me. I'm not. <laughs> I already got enough on my plate right now. I'm good. Eric, I'll head it up. <laughs> Throw me in, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, is there anything else you want to say before we sign out of here? Anything you want to encourage people to look at, research, do for themselves? Anything like that? You don't have to look at the camera. You can look if at I me If I could, tell like, <laughs> talk to medical providers. <laughs> And like yeah, pharmaceutical yeah. companies. Something stupid. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's look at the whole picture here. Yep. Let's not just start, like, let's not just look at the patient and the symptoms that they're having. What's actually going on in this individual's life? I think that that would help significantly in prescribing any medications. Yeah. yeah. Um, other than that, like. That was, no, that's great. Let's keep open minds yeah. and like think about this stuff more often because I don't think we think about it until like I have a child and they're having these symptoms yeah. and I'm like, oh no, now what do I do? What do, do I take the medications? Do I do therapy? Done, and yeah, like, and then you have to figure it all out on the spot. Right. Yeah. So. Well, and the one thing I'll say to anybody that might be diagnosed with any any kind of mental health is is you know take your medication get stabilized get safe and healthy and then start you know exercising three to five times a week start meditating for 10 20 minutes a day start trying to have a healthy balanced diet and then doing something social and interactive mm -hmm. like once or twice a week just start trying to be a healthy centered person mm -hmm. and then from there you know maybe you're you'll be able to stop taking the medication because um, like john said medication shouldn't be the first answer it shouldn't be the forever answer no so and i okay. encourage people to talk about it Yes. Like if this is something you're struggling with or you've been through this experience of like being prescribed Share medications in childhood, talk about it. Mm -hmm. So we know like what the long term effects are. Yep. Mm hmm Yeah. That's all I can really suggest. Perfect. No I way agree more. It. John, anything to add to that? Nah, bruh. All right, guys. This has been No Way But North, where we talk about the miracles of recovery and the tools used to achieve them. Have a great day. Peace. Bye. If you or a loved one are struggling with addiction, call one eight seven seven. 648-3125. The views and opinions expressed in No Way But North do not reflect those of North Point Recovery or any other institution or organization.